the answer is always to organize. You are not the only one going through what you're going through and uh, seek out your coworkers, form a union, get together, think about starting a co-op, but be part of something bigger than yourself because alone we change nothing, but together we can transform the world. It's May Day, the International Day of Protest for Workers' Rights. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, journalist Nathan Schneider takes us inside anti-capitalist struggles around the world, from Nairobi to Spain to Ecuador to Detroit. And join me in Chicago for an exclusive report about a group of brave workers whom we've been following for seven years as they went from occupying their factory to building a worker-owned cooperative. All that, and I have a few words on the major economic story that the money media's not talking about. Welcome to our program. Whatever your view of it, there is no doubting that the Occupy movement was a signal event, and journalist Nathan Schneider was on it from the earliest planning stages. His work since has taken him from Nairobi to Spain to Ecuador to Detroit, looking for people taking control of the economic decisions affecting their lives. He's been writing about these topics and more for publications including Harper's, The Nation, Al Jazeera, New Inquiry, and The Catholic Worker. He has a lot to say, too, about Pope Francis, who's been speaking out on everything from capitalist greed to work around co-ops. Nathan's also the author of two books, God in Proof, The Story of a Search from Ancients to the Internet, and Thank You Anarchy, Notes from the Occupy Apocalypse, both published in 2013 by the University of California Press. Welcome to the program, Nathan. Glad to have you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So it seems like ancient history now, what was your favorite moment of Occupy or the one that sticks with you? Well, the stuff that sticks with me is, is the stuff that I think upset a lot of people who were outside of it, who were kind of looking in from a distance. The stuff like the leaderlessness and the, the assemblies of a thousand people all trying to make a decision at once. And that was the stuff that I think excited a lot of the people who were participating, who were involved. And that really stuck with me. And is it fair to say that that kind of propelled you off into the work you've done since? Absolutely. I've been trying to follow the, the, the threads that that kind of got me going on. Uh, the threads of ways in which people, especially young people today around the world, are trying to participate, participate more deeply in their economic lives and uh, take control of their work lives, their life lives, and all sorts of things in between. Well, one of the places that you've been to is Spain. I recently had the chance to hear uh, the Podemos party leader, Pablo Ignacio, speak in New York. But boy, what have you been hearing when you went there? One of the things that struck me was the kind of grassroots activity that's going on underneath that big political party momentum that's building there. Um, I was in Catalonia around Barcelona and saw a really amazing network of cooperative activity going on. Um, not cooperatives in the old sense, uh, in the familiar sense to many people of like, you know, a cooperative factory where all the workers might own the place together. A lot of people have heard of the Basque region, Mondragon right, network of Right, absolutely, absolutely. And these folks are doing it very differently. They're really doing it more as independent workers, as kind of freelancers, um, but trying to coordinate their activities so they build a cooperative ecosystem tied together by their own currency. Because they're not working in factories, they're working from home, marketing with their iPhones or all, cell phones. All sorts of places. They're working in farms, they're working at computers, they're working uh, in health centers, they're doing yoga, they're doing um, all the things that they need. And the measure of their self-sufficiency, their self-management, is how much they can buy with this internal currency. It's really a remarkable system. So what's their, new, what's their currency called? It's called ECOS, but it has different variants in different places because it's really important for them to create a network, not an overarching new government. So in each region, they have uh, different currencies that are managed by the people in that region, and then they connect together. And all of this um, is linked by something called the Catalan Integral Cooperative. Now, um, gosh, so many directions I could go with this. First, let's talk about the relationship of all of that to the party because you're, mm -hmm. you're touching on something I care a lot about, which is about the way that our media talk about people and parties as if they are completely divorced from what they actually do. Mm -hmm. The parties, I say, do things as well as have leaders. 
Um, yeah. What's Podemos's relationship to this whole network you're talking about? And what do they do on the ground? Well, one of the things that was really striking to me was was being in rooms with uh, with kind of anarchist activists who are watching the TV very closely because their friends are on it, um, being called up through the Podemos process. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of anxiety about that because some of these are very radical folks who've been involved in very grassroots activity. And now there's an opportunity to actually step into the halls of power. And there's a lot of questions about what kind of sacrifices that might entail, uh, what needs to be done in order to be effective but on that level. But presumably some of that activity is part of why Podemos is now poised to possibly Absolutely. win an election where they just were born a few years ago or Absolutely. a year ago or something. And one of, the, one of the things that was most moving to me in my time there was I got to go to an assembly of the PA, which is a, the um, housing resistance movement, the, the platform of people affected by mortgages. And this was a room full of about, of about 100 people, all ages, mostly older, actually, who were there trying to solve their problems with eviction and uh, foreclosure and working with lawyers. And this is years on. They've been incredibly effective. They've gotten limited moratoriums on mortgages, and they've really come to the forefront of the platform of the Podemos uh, project. And there was a very clear link there between the grassroots action and the, the political party's momentum. Uh, you've also been to Ecuador. What are people organizing around there? Well, what I saw in Ecuador was, what I went for was a meeting that was actually convened by the government um, in conjunction, in fact, with some Spanish activists uh, who'd been involved in the 15M movement in 2011. And what they were doing was trying to imagine what a commons-based society might look like. And that, that concept of the commons is really important, I think, for all of this participatory activity. At this point, I should just mention that if people are curious about the commons, they should check out my interview with Peter Leinbaugh, the great yes. historian of the commons, um, in our archives at grittv.org. Check it out. Absolutely. And so much of what you've been doing revolves around this concept in one way or another. Um, it's, it's a way of thinking about economies uh, not just in terms of state or in terms of market, but in terms of participatory yeah. activity. And, um, and in particular, there's been a revival that was fueling this conference of commons thinking yeah. um, in tech culture. You know, open knowledge, open information. Information wants to be free. The ideas that we see in the open source movement and so forth. And this has kind of inspired people to think, well, if we can build an open source operating system and open source software, Maybe we can build a whole society along these lines, too, a whole economy. Now, I was really surprised to read in one of your pieces that Nairobi is the co-op center of Africa. Um, what do you see there? What, what do you mean by that? I was really struck by what I saw in Nairobi. Uh, when I arrived at the airport and started uh, uh, driving into the city center, I saw uh, cooperative banks along the way, and I started asking questions about that and realized that so many people in this society, just as a matter of course, operate in cooperative institutions. And since independence, this country has made cooperatives a bedrock of their economy. And these include uh, producers' cooperatives and small credit unions, uh, everything, in, and then very large cooperative banks. And um, one thing that was really striking to me was I got a chance to go to a college uh, just outside of Nairobi that's just devoted to training managers of cooperatives. <laughs> And the conversation I had there realized, made, helped me realize how important it is to really learn democracy, yeah. to learn economic democracy, that this is not something that comes out of nowhere. And, and this is something that, that a lot of people in that society have been doing all their lives. Well, one of the things I really appreciate your, about your work is you're not just traveling all over in the way that, gosh, I wish I was doing what you're doing, uh, but you're also reminding us that this isn't new. Mm -hmm. Not only is it not only happening somewhere else, it is these initiatives are happening in the United States. It's not being made up out of whole cloth. You trace the roots of a lot of co-op activity to Catholicism. How so? Yeah, well, one of the things I always, a phrase I keep in my mind as I'm working is from Peter Moore and one of the founders of the Catholic Worker. He talked about a philosophy so old that it looks like new. Right. You know, and I see that over and over. Um, I'm, I, I think there's a really strong connection here. Actually, the first credit union in the United States was started by a Catholic church, St. Mary's Bank. Mondragon, which we mentioned earlier in the Basque country, was started by a priest. When I was in Ecuador, went to a village that had this whole uh, cooperative network for all of its industries, also started by a group of Italian priests. Um, start asking, why is that? 
And I think there are really deep roots in Catholic social teaching for cooperative economic activity that are, have, have come up in, in places all around the world. Ideas like subsidiarity, that, that, um, that activities should be governed as locally as possible, mm -hmm. and you build larger structures only when necessary. Uh, also ideas about uh, uh, personalism, you know, that, that, that a society should be driven to bring out the best of a whole person. You know, and that's something that cooperative activity really does. It doesn't reduce a person to a worker, to a laborer. It, it makes a person a full member, uh, a full participant in, in the productive activity. Pope Francis even talked about worker-owned co-ops, among other things. Absolutely. And actually, uh, all of the last few popes have had really remarkable things to say about it. But, but what Francis says really stuck with me, which is that he remembered a conversation with his father where his father, who I think was an accountant, uh, had mentioned, and Francis was very young when he heard this, that cooperativism uh, uh, is slow, but it's true. Hmm. And he said that that stuck with him. And you know, when I read that, it stuck with me as well. It speaks to the length of time it may take to make a decision, but that everybody's on board. Yeah. And not unfamiliar from the Occupy movement. I mean, a lot of what you've described mm -hmm. from the public assemblies got right through to this question you can see some kind of familiar threads. Um, before we go back to that, what about Pope Francis? He's coming to the States. He'll be mm -hmm. here, I think, November, September, something like that. You wrote recently that he could have a lot of Republican Catholic legislators pretty, um, well, shuffling in their seats, at least. I think one of the big Squirming, questions... Squirming, I think, is the word you used. <laughs> could be, <laughs> and not just legislators. Um, I think white Catholics in general might have a real problem. Uh, statistics show that, that uh, uh, Hispanic Catholics in particular, black Catholics as well, are much more likely to, uh, to be concerned about climate change. White Catholics are much less likely to believe it's even an issue. Yeah. And he's about to come out with an encyclical, a very important document, um, emphasizing the importance of the environment and, uh, and stewardship of it. And this, again, is a, it goes back to the commons tradition that's yeah. deep in Catholic thought, the idea that the world is first God's, mm -hmm. and it's an inheritance of all people, and it must be respected and cared for. And he's pointed very clearly to the ways in which modern capitalism is doing just the opposite, and that this is not just a matter of recycling a bit more and stuff like that. This is about really changing the economic system mm -hmm. and our modes of production. And... So I think it's important, too, to connect what he's saying, not just to the, the criticisms of capitalism that he's making that are very powerful, but also the alternatives that uh, he's also alluded to in what he said about cooperativism and what all of social, uh, Catholic social teaching has I mean, to offer there. I mean, it's pretty incredible what he's been saying. And, and this next question may sound glib, but I don't mean it that way. It, it comes down to, you know, should I convert? <laughs> I mean, sometimes I listen to him and I just think, wow, he, he's saying all these incredibly progressive things. He's talking about corruption in the church, greed in capitalism, the environment, you name it. And then I remember, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute. I'm still a woman. I'm mm -hmm. still a lesbian. This guy is not actually on my side. Well, right? one thing as a Catholic myself that I always have to remember is the Pope is not the church. Uh -huh. And one person is not the church. The church is much bigger than that. You know, and, and the things that have really kept me in this church and made it a place where I can live, you know, are, are people who are able to do things that he couldn't do uh, or that he hasn't done. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, someone very important to me is a nun who works with trans transgender people who has to do it in secret. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, these, are, th these are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, that I think are Anyway, there's a church <laughs> beyond this man. <laughs> In the category of he still has to move on some things. Let's talk beyond the church about the question of change. You talked about currency. Um, I, you know, in this country... We had debates about local currencies in the first years after the War of Independence. Mm -hmm. And it was decided very clearly that the federal government was going to have a federal bank. We were not going to have local currencies. This would be wrong. Um, is there a chance to revive these conversations 
now? And what are the legal and maybe constitutional obstacles that exist insofar as you've looked into it? I think these conversations are definitely being revived now. There's been a real craving, I, I think, actually on the kind of libertarian right uh, to explore things like cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin. Uh, uh, people have just been diving into those uh, uh, very deeply. And, and we I should say it's partly because during the financial crisis, they saw banks kind of abandon their role of offering credit to people yeah. with small businesses and so on. Sure. We bailed them out, but they kind of abdicated their job. What well, when we do Bitcoin came out in early 2009, it was explicitly presented as being an alternative to this financial sector uh, that was in the midst of disaster. So absolutely, the connection is very clear. Um, but I think there's another piece uh, to that whole question of currency that, that that community has not really been raising and that I hope that others will, which is what is the social structure that governs a currency, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, no matter how good your algorithm is, no matter how good the technology that your currency is built on, uh, it still matters how you're relating to each other as people. How do you build the hierarchies and the structures um, or non-hierarchies around which you make decisions about that currency? Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin, for instance, you know, very cra carefully crafted algorithm has become incredibly centralized, incredibly uh, uh, unequal in the distribution of wealth. And I think that's a warning sign that we shouldn't just hope that the right currency will save us. We really need to deal with those power relations and develop alternative mm -hmm. currencies through that. And, and that structure I saw in, in Spain did exactly that. They have a currency, but they don't pretend that their community currency is going to save them. The important thing for them is that they govern themselves democratically and that they govern how that, how that currency works in that way as well. Nathan Schneider, thank you so much for your work and for coming into the Laura Flanders Show. Thank you so much. Seven years into a devastating economic crisis in the United States, the wealthy have more than ever and the rest of us have less than ever. But one group of workers is taking matters into their own hands. I went to Chicago to check on their progress. It's up to the workers. They decide where they want to put their profits. If they're earning money, do they want to put it more into wages? Do they want to put it towards benefits? It's all up to them and they sit down every week and hash it all out. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. In 2008, the workers at this Windows factory occupied their plant to resist being laid off by their boss. Ever since, they've worked towards creating a worker-owned cooperative. And that's just what they've done. They may not be selling millions of windows yet, but they're well on their way. And the fact that they're here at all is a survival story. We've been following it for seven years. Leia Fried is director of international strategies for UE, the union that's represented these workers since before they first occupied what was then the Republic Windows and Doors factory. The workers saw their workplace closed. They occupied for six days won a settlement, but then didn't have jobs. Amazingly enough, another company bought it, agreed to hire everybody back, recognized the union, recognized the contract, and then a couple years later they closed. During the second occupation, um, the workers had gone through a process uh, of realizing that they needed to have a little bit more control over their lives and that a co-op was something they were interested in possibly launching. And so during that second occupation, which happened in February 2012, one of the demands they made was that the company had to sell and possibly sell to the workers if no one else was interested. And that began this very long process. Now, three years later, we're here. They're making windows. They're selling them. They're making a little bit of money and growing, which is amazing. But really, this is a story, I think, about um, when you struggle, you can win. And this is the first machine we start on, on the factory. This one, what did? What this machine do is uh, wash the glass. Early on, Armando Robles envisioned owning the factory. But it hasn't been easy. I visited his home and spoke to his family about the struggles they faced as he and his co-workers transitioned from workers to worker owners. It, it was kind of hard because sometimes we didn't have, we, it's like we have to limit ourselves for a lot of stuff. Like we... You know, sometimes we didn't have enough to buy grocery, or either it's grocery or pay bills, or either one thing or another thing. 
and it was kind of hard. It was getting harder and harder. But then, you know, my kids would tell me, Mom, don't worry, we're going to get out of this, we're going to get out of this. This season, the, the, the one we just passed is really, uh, it was really kind of uh, slow. But we maintain our, our hope and we're still working in the factory, uh, dedicating the most time we can in, in, in the factory. We could see around the, the city a lot of uh, struggle. We have the people from the fast food uh, restaurants fighting for 15 an hour. Having uh, four, three children, my wife and myself work in, in the house. And working both, is, is, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to pay the rent. It's kind of hard to, to, to afford to have a, a, a good, a decent life. You and I first talked, I think, in the fall of 2008 as the occupation oh, yeah. was happening. Yeah. Did you, I mean, those were tough times. There were it half was, a million people being yeah. laid out of work, laid off work every month. Mm -hmm. Most people were just going home. Mm -hmm. These workers decided not to do that. They were pissed. But did you ever imagine anything like this? I've known them all for quite a while. And I have to say, they have taken on this challenge and grown so much and learned so much and been able to handle so much. They have figured out accounting, they do sales, um, you know, and they've learned not only skills within the factory, I mean, they all know how to do everything practically, and, uh, and also in the office, but they've also gained this incredible confidence. Like, they just, they've got this. Right. I think for a lot of folks, they look to New Era and they say, this could be my life. I could make a living wage. I could be in control of my life um, and are really inspired by it. And we really want to share that experience as much as possible. We invite people to come visit the factory. The factory is kind of open to everybody, unless you're a former owner of Republic Windows and Doors, in which case you're not invited. Um, but, you know, it's, the doors are open for people to come and learn and, and see what's possible. So you like being a business owner? Or business owner? Yes, I really do. Um, Does it feel different? Yes, my whole life, a lot different. Do you stay up at night worrying like Armando used to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried not too long ago until oh, yeah. we started getting these orders in. So what would you say are the biggest challenges New Era is facing? The fact that they're competing with these low-wage companies. You know, Ron Spielman, who used to own Republic Windows and Doors, started a window factory. All the workers are temps. They make minimum wage. There's no health insurance. There's no benefits. And so... Even if you have a co-op that pays a living wage and can function because they don't have the overhead of crazy boss salaries, um, you're still in competition with all these folks that are depressing wages. A lot of these businesses, their business model is based on wage theft. Um, and there's also a great deal of discrimination. I mean, a lot of temp agencies will straight up say, I only want young women. Mm -hmm. Totally disgusting. And it's all because the supervisors like to be around young women. It's gross, so they can sexually harass them. Um, sometimes they say they only want Latino workers. They won't hire black workers. Well, Monday, Monday we started the biggest order ever. Five hundred and eighty women. And uh, we've already had some large orders like this order. Here's a sixty window order. Co-ops are one of many tactics that we employ in a strategy to overcome the abuses of capitalism. Cooperatives can be uh, an answer in a very specific situation like ours, where we saw the company close and we seized an opportunity with an organized workforce to, to take control. But co-ops can't be the only answer. The reality is we need a vibrant labor movement, and that doesn't necessarily mean only traditional unions. You know, obviously I'm with UE. I'm with a, a traditional mm -hmm. union. I like to organize workers and negotiate contracts, but being part of the labor movement means organizing workers in many different forms, whether it's a non-majority movement like Warehouse Workers for Justice or the Fight for 15 um, or the domestic workers, which are all examples of workers getting organized outside of that traditional model. Any message to anyone out there, to workers out there maybe in a struggle or seeing one down the road? The answer is always to organize. You are not the only one going through what you're going through and uh, seek out your coworkers form a union, get together, think about starting a co-op, but be part of something bigger than yourself because alone we change nothing, but together we can transform the world. 
That was our exclusive report on the workers at New Era Windows. To see more of our reporting on them and other solidarity economy struggles, visit our website. LED signs, banner drops, projections on famous monuments, people have used all manner of tactics to spread the word about the TPP, or Trans-Pacific Partnership. Still, a vote on the largest trade pact of our time is looming before most voters have even heard of it. Media coverage might have helped, but in the 18 months leading up to January 1st this year, CBS Evening News, ABC's World News Tonight, and NBC's Nightly News made no mention of the TPP. None. And cable news was hardly better, according to Media Matters. Now, the TPP is a story, but it's not your story. It's a Beltway story about how the deal's fate will affect politicians. Will the president get what he wants? Will her support for the pact hurt Hillary? What about all those Republican haters who finally found something Barackish to love? You know the drill. Expecting monopoly-made media to cover a made-for-monopolies trade deal is madness. Why should they? Consider, the same money media that endlessly cover politics and personalities are unlikely to wade into the weeds about jobs and wages and profits. Why? Because they have flesh in the trade deal game. Multinational mass media corporations like Walt Disney, News Corp and Comcast distribute content and own outlets around the world. Pesky citizens in some countries have already passed environmental regulations, consumer protection laws, and labor rights hurting manufacturers, they say. What if people started passing laws defending media pluralism, too? What if cities or states started passing legislation that favored homegrown media makers or close-to-home distributors over Disney? A draft of the TPP leaked by WikiLeaks contains provisions that permit global corporations to sue and to charge for compensation for lost profits, too. On our show, we talk every week with people who've soured on neoliberalism, seeing the disastrous consequences they're committed to deepening democracy and decentralizing wealth. Some are inspired by participatory budgeting in Brazil, others by the Zapatista experiment in Mexico. Many fancy putting local tax dollars to work to favor local worker-recovered companies like the ones in Argentina, or cooperatives like those in Mondragon, Spain. The TPP makes all of that harder. But to paraphrase the poet Audre Lorde, don't look to the master's media to cover the master's monopolies. It won't happen. Want a new economic system? You need a systemically different media, too. Thanks for watching. Tell me what you think. Write to Laura, L A U R A, at grittv.org. See you next time. This week on the show, Octavia's brood. It was like, oh no, I just outed myself as a nerd to Mumia. And Mumia just flowed with it. And he was like, right, live long and prosper. I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> so much of how we've been socialized to be human is to resist change, to try to create these institutions, to take over everything. One, two, three. From somewhere, maybe on the Enterprise, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders in Caracas, Venezuela, where one of the big questions is, who owns what? Nosotros creemos aquí, los jóvenes, que una revolución es posible en los Estados Unidos. Por eso mi mensaje es a todos los jóvenes estadounidenses que sigan movilizándose, que sigan luchando. The Magna Carta established the rights of the commons. Our next guest is the historian on this topic. I think human happiness ended at a certain point with the birth of capitalism.